to The Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we are going to be exploring a sad and mysterious case from Cheshire which involves the murder of 17-year-old Brenda Evans. Her murder was shocking to the community as it appeared to happen to a respectable woman in a peaceful area in the middle of the day. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Poulton is an area in the civil parish of Poulton and Pulford in Cheshire, in the northwest of England. It's a very small area with the population in 2001 listed as just 92. Despite being in Cheshire, it is also very close to the Welsh border. It has been a site of archaeological importance for a number of years, with evidence of an Iron Age roundhouse and some Roman Age discoveries being made there. It's a very small place where residents know their neighbours, and new people to the area are noticed. This is where 17-year-old Brenda Evans called home in 1977. She lived with her parents, Harry and Betty Evans, and older sister Airless, who had just turned 18 in September 1977. Brenda was known to be a quiet but pleasant girl. Her parents were known in the community and were members of the local British Legion Club. They were also connected with the local Church of St Mary. Brenda, although quiet and somewhat reserved, had become engaged in 1977 to a 20-year-old man named John Pritchard, who worked as a farm labourer in the area. He too, friends would say, was quiet, but the pair seemed very well suited. It was at the British Legion Club where the couple had celebrated their engagement in the summer of 1977. Those that knew them described them as happy, and around 80 friends and family attended the party to wish them well. Brenda had also got a new job, working in the Poulton Post Office. Brenda did well in this role and her employer later explained that she was very trustworthy and showed promise in the job. It appeared that Brenda was enjoying both her relationship and her job and 1977 had been a happy year in many respects. On October 7th, 1977, Brenda went to work at the post office as usual. She worked in the morning and then took her lunch break. She had a set routine and would often visit her aunt and uncle who lived around a half a mile walk from the post office. She would have something to eat and then walk back to work. And this is the same routine that she had on October the 7th. She travelled to her aunt and uncle's house and then set off back to the post office for the normal time. Samuel Roberts, the postmaster, had been impressed with Brenda's work ethic since she had been employed in the role and knew her to be a reliable worker. He had no problems with her timekeeping since she'd started. On October the 7th, however, he noticed that Brenda was late, arriving back from her lunch break. This seemed strange to him, and although it worried him, he didn't know immediately to do anything about it. There were several reasons why Brenda may not have come back to work, and while it was unusual, it was not unheard of for an employee. Samuel continued to work that afternoon, and later on Brenda's mum came into the shop to buy something. Samuel explained to her that Brenda had not returned from her lunch break, and she was immediately worried. Brenda would never have willingly abandoned her shift. It wasn't like her to do something like that. She became concerned that she had not returned and knew immediately that it was out of character. As several hours had now passed with no sign of Brenda, her family and friends decided to go out and search for her. They hoped that she might be somewhere along the route that she had taken from her aunt and uncle's house to the post office. After finding out that she had indeed made it to their house for her lunch, they started to search everywhere they thought she might have been to next. Brenda's aunt and uncle were able to confirm that she had left their home at around 1.50pm and the distance from their house to the post office was only around half a mile. The searchers decided to fan out along the route. Everyone hoped that they would not find anything, however as it got later into the evening, panic and alarm began to set in. Edith Pritchard, the mother of Brenda's fiancé John, had also joined in the search that day 
after finding out that she had not returned to work and could not be found. During the search, Edith decided to look in a wooded area close to Back Lane in Poulton. When she looked around the area, it's reported that she noticed something in the woods. It was a manhole that was around 12 feet deep. Edith got closer to the manhole and it was here that she spotted a body. It was Brenda's body. She wasn't moving and it was immediately apparent that something terrible had happened. Horrified by the discovery, Edith immediately contacted the rest of the search party and the police. The investigation that then began would soon turn into the search for answers and a murderer. Detectives led by Detective Chief Inspector Gerald Williams and Detective Inspector Roy Suckley, head of Cheshire Support Group, sealed off the area where Brenda's body was found. One of the notable and sad things about where Brenda's body was was that it was just a few hundred yards from her home. What could have possibly happened on her way from her aunt and uncle's house? And who, in the small and tight-knit area, would have wanted to hurt Brenda? Police immediately removed Brenda's body from the manhole, and it was apparent that this had not just been a tragic accident. Brenda had not just fallen into the manhole. She was found partially clothed, and it was evident that she had been strangled with her own tights. Police also released the information early on in the investigation that she had been beaten around the head. The investigation focused on the area where Brenda had been found and where she had been that day. Police retraced her steps and canvassed homes close to the scene. In the immediate aftermath of the murder, while police were waiting for the official results of the post-mortem, they focused their attention on the local area. It was clear that whoever had committed this horrific murder knew the area and knew where they could dispose of Brenda's body. The fact that they had gone to the lengths to hide Brenda's body suggested that the perpetrator may indeed be known to the community. A stranger may not have spent time doing this. A week after Brenda's murder on the 14th of October, Gerald Williams made a statement to the Cheshire Observer. He explained that the perpetrator may indeed be a local man who was being shielded by his friends. He stated, It could be a difficult decision for someone to come forward with information about someone close to them. Police brought in frogmen to search the manhole that was full of water. Police also used metal detectors to search the overground areas around the scene. A large part of the two-acre thicket was also felled and searched as part of the police investigation. It was confirmed by Detective Superintendent Roy Suckley that they were indeed looking for a murder weapon and told the Cheshire Observer, We are also searching for anything at all that might help in this inquiry. It was clear that police believed that a weapon may have also been used in the attack on Brenda. The community in Poulton were rocked by the news of Brenda's murder, and many residents were worried that whoever had committed this crime may strike again. The idea that such a savage killer had been in their midst, and may still be around, made many people concerned. The fact that the police had also stated that the perpetrator could be someone in the local area also scared the residents. The detectives immediately began interviewing locals and those close to Brenda. One of these people was John Pritchard, her fiancé. This is not unexpected during a murder investigation, as those closest to the victim are often looked into first, in order to rule out any personal connection to the crime. There was also another reason why John was being looked into, and this was where he was at the time of Brenda's murder. He'd been working in the field cutting hedges that was located only 500 yards from where her body had been discovered. This was something that the police had to investigate, and it's reported that they questioned John about his movements that day for 27 hours. He was then released on bail by the police for four weeks, but was later never charged with any crimes. While the police continued to investigate, the inquest into Brenda's death was carried out. It began on the 20th of October and it was here that Home Office pathologist J.G. Benstead from the North West Forensic Science Laboratory stated what he had discovered about Brenda's cause of death. 
Benstead stated that Brenda's cause of death was strangulation. This, it was later found out, had been carried out using Brenda's own tights. In contemporary articles, it stated that Brenda's body had some wounds on her arms, which may have been carried out after death. It is speculated in some newspapers at the time that this may have been done to try and convince people that Brenda may have committed suicide. There is no evidence that I can find that this is true, and an article from the Cheshire Observer on the 21st of October states that Benstead said nothing about the marks which are supposed to have been made on Brenda's body after her death, or about events which are thought to have taken place before she died. It's unclear if these marks did exist on Brenda's body, as this was not discussed at the inquest. However, the fact that police did search for a weapon may indicate that she did have some other injuries. The coroner, Mr Michael Holloway, gave consent for Brenda's body to be released for her funeral, and he expressed sympathy to her family at such a difficult time. The police spokesman, Inspector Arthur Norris, stated that the investigation was still wide open and that the search is going on intensively by the minute, but it's a long and painstaking process. Brenda's funeral took place on the 24th of October at St Mary's Church in Pulford. Her family and friends gathered to pay their respects to a beloved member of the local community. Brenda's parents and her fiancé John were completely devastated by the loss, and the tragedy for them was that Brenda had had so much to look forward to in the future including her marriage and her new house. It was decided that Brenda would be buried with a large teddy bear, her engagement ring and a bouquet of flowers. Brenda's father, Harry, told the Liverpool Echo, I don't think John could bear to keep the things that brought back memories of the happy days that they had together. It was his wish that they should be buried with her, together with his flowers. The sad events were also closely followed by the detectives some of which attended the funeral. This was often done by detectives in the hope that they may see some possible suspicious behaviour from some of the mourners. If the person who committed the crime was someone close to Brenda, then they may well attend the funeral, and perhaps do something to alert the police. While this did not lead police to any new information, they did receive a tip from a witness. A woman named Mrs McNaught, a neighbour of Brenda's, reported that she had been driving down Old Lane going towards Pulford at around 1.45pm on the 7th of October, the day that Brenda had been murdered. She noticed a woman with long fair hair and a dark blue coat walking on the right-hand side of Old Lane, going towards Pulford. It was later confirmed that this was most probably Brenda, walking back to work from her aunt and uncle's. Mrs McNaught pulled onto the Chester Wrexham Road and as she did she spotted a dark blue car turn into Old Lane and drive in the direction of where Brenda was walking. The police later put out a more specific description asking for anyone that may have seen a dark blue saloon car similar to a Mark II Ford Cortina or a green car of the daft make. This was important as this was the first witness who had seen Brenda that day and she was possibly the last person to see her alive before her murder. The car was such an important lead that they published this in many places to try and jog someone's memory of the day. They also decided to carry out a reconstruction of the day that Brenda was killed. 20-year-old policewoman Denise Piggott walked the same route that she had taken that day, wearing similar clothes to her. She set off at 1.50pm from Springfield Cottage where her aunt and uncle lived and travelled down Old Lane. This timeline was based on Brenda's aunt and uncle's recollection of the day. It was known that other witnesses also repeated their actions that day. It was hoped that someone would see this reconstruction and remember something that they had previously not believed was important. Another car, a white Ford Escort, was also spotted in the area of Back Lane around the time of Brenda's murder, and this description was also published. Police also decided to board buses along the Chester to Wrexham route going through Pulford, in order to jog the passengers' memories of anything that they may have seen. 
Sadly, nobody appeared to have spotted anything suspicious that day, and this reconstruction did not lead to any new information. The question that was continually being asked by both the police and those in the community was how did someone murder Brenda in public and in broad daylight in the afternoon? It seemed implausible that there were no witnesses to such a crime. Detectives, however, later reported that they believed that it was possible that the killer had been with Brenda for as long as an hour and a half, and she may have gone to the particular area with them willingly. It's unclear why police believed this to be the case, however it is possible that it was speculated that this is how Brenda arrived at Back Lane where her body was eventually discovered. Did she know the perpetrator, and walked or travelled in a car with them willingly? If this was indeed the case, it may explain why witnesses had not seen anything suspicious that day. If it was someone from the community, they may not have stood out in the area. In the month after Brenda's murder, despite hundreds of police officers from both England and Wales conducting thousands of interviews with local residents and witnesses, the investigation began to come to a slow halt. Edith Pritchard, John's mother, spoke to the Cheshire Observer in November 1977. She described how devastated both she and John were about Brenda's murder and how finding Brenda's body had affected her. She explained that she was having nightmares, and the gossip surrounding the fact that the murderer could have been someone close to Brenda had been affecting both her and her son. She also described an event that happened at the beginning of November at around 11pm. She said she'd been watching a film and went into the kitchen when she saw a man's face peering through the window. She ran to the front window and saw some red car lights. She described the man as young, with fair cropped hair. This, she said, petrified her, but she had not told police about this encounter as she was too scared. Edith went on to explain why she looked for Brenda in Back Lane, saying that she knew that courting couples would often go there and she thought if someone had abducted her they might have taken her there. She said, Whoever killed Brenda must have been local because that particular blackberry patch near to where I found Brenda was known to Pulford people and children only. She also spoke about her son and the investigation, saying, He now has his car back from the police. I'm sure they think someone told me where to look for Brenda, but it just isn't true. She ended the interview with the Cheshire Observer by saying, I wish this strain will be lifted off John and me and Brenda's murderer found. After Edith's interview with the newspaper, the police went to speak to her about what she had seen that night. From her description, detectives were able to create an identikit picture and published it in the Cheshire Observer. It is, of course, unclear whether this person had anything to do at all with Brenda's murder. It was clear that the intense questioning by police had taken its toll on Edith and the memory of finding Brenda was traumatic to her. She believed that someone local had been involved with the murder and it was a suspicion that the police also held after the thorough investigation. As 1977 turned into 1978, the murder was still in the minds of the local community. And in January, an alarming event happened that once again made the residents of Pulford concerned. In a telephone box close to the place where Brenda's body had been found, a message had been found scratched in with a ballpoint pen. The message read, I will strike again. This message was terrifying to the local residents, many of whom believe that the perpetrator may live amongst them. This has been the prevailing theory since Brenda's murder, and rumours and mystery have continually swirled around the local area. It was reported in the Liverpool Echo on the 9th of January that the police had held back a piece of forensic evidence, and it was hoped that the perpetrator would eventually disclose this information that was only known to police. They stated at the time, This has been a tough case, but we'll crack it. It's just a question of time. The case has indeed proved to be a tough one for the police, as up until the present day, Brenda's case is still unsolved. Over the years, the case has been shrouded in mystery, due to the fact that not all the details have been published about her murder. Police have held back some evidence, in the hope that this will help find the killer eventually. 
The case has been continually reviewed over the years, however there has been no new information found. In 2013 it's reported that detectives were conducting a cold case review into the murder. Police spokeswoman Shelley Williams told Cheshire Live, You'll appreciate that technology and forensic capabilities have improved since her murder in 1977, and at this moment in time we are conducting a forensic review of the evidence in the case. There have been no developments of significance in any other line of investigation at present. Police have made it clear that they are not giving up on Brenda's case, and they do review their cold cases regularly. I am hopeful that new information will come forward in Brenda's case, and she may finally get justice for what happened to her. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I am really interested to hear your thoughts on this case. There is little evidence to go on, but I would like to know if you agree with the assessment that a local person was involved in Brenda's murder. Please let me know your thoughts. As always, thank you to everyone that continues to support the podcast by leaving us a five-star review wherever you listen, and thank you to all our Patreon supporters. If you want to support us on Patreon, you can get shout-outs in the show, stickers, postcards, and access to bonus episodes. The link is in the show notes. Please follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you can also join our Facebook discussion group. If you want to suggest a case for future episodes, you can contact me on social media or email me at theunseenpod at gmail.com. As always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Unseen.